Okay, so it's 12 sharp. Welcome everybody to our weekly bootstrap seminar. Uh, today we're very happy to have Sasha Shiboyedo from CERN uh, telling us about an analytic toolkit for the S-Matrix bootstrap. Thank you, Sasha. Thanks, Leonardo. Hi, everyone. Um, my, my talk will be based on <coughs> the recent paper with uh, uh, Miguel Correa and Amit Sever and some uh, work we also done with Madalena Lemos. Please ask me if you have uh, questions. I'll try to, to explain the basic ideas. Maybe I need some technical details. So, okay, that's um, last week, I guess we, we had this school and we had uh, here many interesting uh, lectures. So, and uh, a couple of results, which I would like to bring up is that uh, of course, a famous plot, how we can uh, zoom in into the high dimensional CFTs and solve them or partially solve them like 3 d Ising model, which was covered by Peter and uh, this uh, great plot, uh, which uh, um, was covered by Pedro Vieira of uh, two dimensional S matrices. And uh, in both cases, uh, we, we run some kind of bootstrap uh, problem and uh, we find this uh, physical theories which we can zoom in and and extract the interesting physical information about physical theories in some sense solve them uh, let me call it loosely like that so the open challenge is of course and it's very old challenge is to bootstrap physical s matrices in uh, higher dimensions uh, so by high i mean d larger equals m3 of course it's also challenge in d equal to but my talk will be mostly d equal will be about you larger equals n3 you will understand uh, why and uh, this is a very old challenge as, as you know it's um it's uh, famously was very active in the 60s and 70s and uh, the, this oldest matrix bootstrap and uh, sometimes uh, people say that uh, this oldest matrix bootstrap has failed and uh, usually uh, I think if, if you are a bootstrapper, they, they derive many interesting results. They were discussing bounds, but they definitely uh, failed to solve a, a physical theory by example. And they did now one of the most interesting candidates would be QCD and uh, they couldn't, they couldn't uh, solve it using bootstrap methods. Recently there was, uh, well, recently in the last, I guess, 20 or 10 years, uh, there was some uh, attempts to revive these ideas. And uh, um, well, first of all, there is a per sort of perturbative revolution. If you look at the Zoomplitudes, there is a big, big community doing all kinds of amazing things uh, so by studying perturbative amplitudes. There are many remarkable structures and uh, which are still to be understood. Um, but my talk will be mostly non-perturbative uh, so my, my, my interest will be non-perturbative S matrices. And here, the, the inspiration for this work is a, is a recent uh, work by Miguel Paolo, Joao Canedon, Stron Toledo, Balfan Vies, and Pedro Vieira. Some of them are here, so they will correct me if I say something erroneous. And, uh, and uh, still, we, we, have this, we have this challenge. And so why... Uh, why, why the problem is so hard? And I guess you can discuss many reasons and many, many, many subtleties, but basically we, um, we do not understand uh, the multi-point amplitude. So, you know, if you have a collision of two particles, you can create many particles. That's a relativistic theory. And, um, and uh, we have some idea about uh, two to two scattering, but um, the higher point amplitudes unless uh, it was some, some very specific theory as discussed last week in one of the discussions, we really don't have a good control uh, about the analytic properties, et cetera. And this was a very hard problem 50 years ago, and it's a very hard problem today, and uh, there was, hasn't been any progress as far as I know. And uh, I'm not sure there is much hope. Uh, but it, in this talk, uh, we will try to exploit some, some interplay between the particle production and uh, the properties of two to two amplitude, which is available in D larger equals N3 to hopefully make some progress. And, uh, and as I hope uh, to, to convince you to some extent, and especially from maybe many uh, young bootstrappers, there are many challenges and many things to try. And uh, 
uh, it's, it's not guaranteed that we succeed, but we should definitely be able to fail better than in the 60s. So, and uh, that would be uh, the, the um, one of the one of the messages. So we should we can try many things. And uh, uh, what is this relation uh, between scattering and production in higher dimensions? So let me present you a simple physical picture. Why, you have, if you have two to two scattering in uh, three higher dimensions, you have high point scattering? Well, you can uh, consider the simple process. Imagine you have two to two scattering being non-zero, so particle scatter. Then you can imagine uh, two particles, one propagating around P plus, around X plus, another around X minus, and they separate it in some impact parameter. And then you would think that they can exchange this virtual particle and therefore produce uh, four particles in the final states like here. And indeed you can make it more precise by going to impact parameter space. And then uh, the, this process is dominated by on shell particle here. And so then if you have each of these blobs being on zero, two to two, um, you have two to four being on zero. And uh, this argument works because uh, if you exchange some multi-particle states here, again, they, they contribute by simple, you cover potential type reasoning, their contribution is suppressed by their mass. And so if you have multi-particle states, say three particles, it will be suppressed by three. And B, and so if by going to large impact parameter space, you will have production. So um, you see, I cannot run this argument in two dimensions because there is no impact parameter, uh, and uh, that's a basic reason. And uh, so, of course, it's not surprising, but it has a very interesting twist. This simple physical idea has interesting mathematical expression, and and. Uh, Technically, this, this, this hierarchy between one particle state, say so two particle state and multi-particle state, which is something which is only available in the gap theory, we do not have in CFT, will be the tool, uh, one of the tools, and in, in for two to two scattering, it has a name of elastic unitarity, uh, which we will exploit. And uh, it's, it's, it's an opportunity because uh, elastic unitarity was never implemented properly in, in the bootstrap considerations. It was not implemented in the 60s. It's not implemented in the recent uh, revival. So it's a challenge and hopefully we can make progress. And uh, if we cannot directly understand this multi-particles, maybe we can make progress by understanding this elastic unitarity. So it was not implemented in the derivation of frost are bound basically in any of the many of the results from, from the 60s. So the plan of the talk is the following. The first part is essential, can be thought of a lecture five of Pedro's course. It's, uh, well, let me call it analytical, it's matrix bootstrap. It's, uh, in some sense, it's, it has been known since the 60s. We, we were inspired by the recent developments. It's an S matrix analog of what was covered in lectures by Simon in CFT. So if you want to do analytical non perturbative computations, that's what you will do. And this is very solid. So I don't think there is, uh, this will, this is just correct. <coughs> Sorry. And the second part will be numerical implementation, which I, I call open-ended because I think that we can have many discussions and I, I don't know what is the best way to proceed, but I will mention a few few directions and then we can discuss. So let me start with a setup. We, we think of, uh, we consider a scattering in a unitary relativistic gap theory. So all particles have mass and for simplicity, I consider a theory where the only uh, stable particle is a scalar with mass M. Um, so here on the, on the picture, you, have, you see a collision of two particles in the center of mass frame. Um, uh, in the far past and far future, the state of your theory is described by a set of particles, um, free particles, which form a Fox space. And then there is a unitary operator called S, uh, S matrix, which maps you in states to out states, which we want to study. Um, I will focus as usual, as always, on a two to two scattering um, in higher dimensions. So this T is a connected element. One is a, if you have a theory, if you have a free scalar, the S matrix is one. So um, there is no collision. This T, uh, it's, a, it's a connected matrix element and in higher dimensions, it depends on energy and angle. Um, so if you have a physical scattering of particles with some energy and some angle, then uh, 
uh, this matrix elements gives you a number. And uh, this is a Mandelstam plane, so there are three channels depending on which party, which channel you consider. Uh, so given the energy and the angle and the channel, <clears throat> you, you, this, this matrix element spits out for you a complex number. Now the starting point for the whole subject is the realization that, uh, of, uh, that there is an underlying analyticity of this object. In other words, this, this matrix element or this, this T function is, uh, is a boundary value of analytic function. And this analyticity is related uh, to the has an origin in the causality of the underlying theory is that we have a light cone, but it's more subtle. It's very interesting how you derive this many of the analytic properties. But basically that's a starting point. So we have a function and uh, we should think of this function now a function of two complex variables. If you land uh, on the real axis with some, uh, um, with some physical values of S and T, you get the, the physical amplitude. But of course, we would like now to study the function of two complex numbers. So there is a set of standard assumptions. They have different uh, footing. They are on a different footing. So first is a crossing. It's uh, pretty solid. This is just a statement that we scatter identical particles. Then there is real analyticity, which is also pretty solid. Um, for simplicity in this talk, I will assume that uh, I have a theory where with Z2 symmetry and the stable particle is Z2 odd. And there are no bound states. And this is just technical assumption. And, uh, and uh, the, the not something which hasn't been proved is uh, the, the, the last three. It's one is a polynomial boundedness. This has been proved uh, for, um, for physical S and T and uh, for some physical S and T, but I will assume just for any S and T. Um, so if you take one of the variables to be large, the, the amplitude is polynomially bounded. S second is uh, something which is known as extended analyticity, which is a statement that the only singularities are those required by unitarity. So um, as I will review, uh, the, the, this T function develops non-analyticity, which relates to, um, uh, to unitarity. And the basic structure is that we have a S channel cut, T channel cut, and a U channel cut, and there is nothing else. Uh, so. And finally, as uh, this, this t, t uh, this amplitude, this function t of s and t, uh, uh, when, when we go to the physical values of s and t, it's in, in principle, it's a distribution. It's not a function. It's, it's more similar to Whiteman functions. However, it's common it, it, in, uh, in many applications to assume that, that it's actually nice and uh, that it's uh, something continuous. And uh, well, we can have theta functions, but we do not have uh, something more crazy. And so I will not assume it for some parts of the talk, for, for some parts of the talk, I will assume that it is the case. It's sometimes called in the literature, in the S-metrics literature, pathologist a la Martin, because Martin discussed them. And there is an interesting connection of uh, this property of continuity and something known as macrocausality. Uh, macrocausality is something which is opposed to microcausality, which is a statement that operators and underlying quantum field theory commute. And uh, macrocausality is a statement about factorizations of, of amplitudes. And if you assume certain physically natural factorizations in some directions, which you cannot prove your QFT, this continuity follows. Anyhow, it's an interesting subject and I will assume it, but you should have in mind that we are dealing in principle with distributions. Uh, Sasha, can I ask, uh, yeah. uh, what is, can, can you explain what is the distinction between extended and Analyticity and maximal analyticity? Yes. Uh, so uh, in principle, you are free to assume analyticity as much uh, as you feel comfortable with. For example, you can say that, um, so what is the basic picture? Let's say you take T to be negative and S to be large and positive. So it's a physical scattering. Then you start continuing T to be positive. Uh, and you can imagine something crazy happening, something like a new cuts and new singularities coming from the second sheet and so populate your physical sheet. And so this can be wild. And so I'm assuming that this doesn't happen, but it's up to me to decide uh, how much of it. And so a maximal anticity is a statement that for any S and T, say for any absolute value of S and T, this is the structure of the complex plane. Extended analyticity is that, for example, I assume that for S less than 10 M square, this is the structure of the complex plane, but I do not commit to what happens if I go to the far away. So it, it, the, the relation is that maximal extended analyticity is strictly included in maximal analyticity, but it does not imply it. We can, uh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry. I, I, maybe I just didn't understand what your definition of extended analyticity is. 
in your picture, you drew as if D and S were real. Uh, we're going through the cut, uh, but yeah. do, you, do you mean that, or do you mean to that this picture will continue to to extend? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. This will this will continue to this will continue to hold for a complex T and S. So this is drawn for say for the S cut is drawn for 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 real uh, for real T, but now we can can start continuing uh, in T to be say in, in in this 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 talk I will be considering unphysical S and T. So S and T will be both positive, and so this will continue to hold even though. Um, for both S and T positive, it does not correspond to physical scattering, and in principle, you you can. It hasn't been proven that this is a correct picture. Let me take say this picture, uh, say for S and take T to be large and positive. Mm -hmm. uh, so and about uh, uh, your yeah. assumption for number bound is for arbitrary complex S, S and T. Do you mean just the first sheet or? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, sorry, just first sheet. So the whole talk is on the physical sheet. I will not uh, leave it. So okay. um, yeah, this. Um, so I'll not leave it. So this is the assumptions. Of course, as usual, we can add the words. It would be great to prove it, uh, but okay, I have nothing to say about that. Um, Sasha, sorry, yeah. can I ask you? Yeah. So can you rem remind mm -hmm. us uh, w which analyticity property have been uh, rigorously proven in, uh, following from uh, causality? And which yes, condition? Uh, what? Yeah, it's. Uh, I have. I have an extra slide on that. I we can go to that. But uh, the basically, uh, you um, say for t for absolute value of t less than say four m square for identical particles, this is a correct picture. This has been proven. And um, uh, so then uh, there are some in some particular cases. You can do maybe a little bit better, but basically that if the absolute value of t can be slightly positive, but less than 4m square, this is a result by Martin, that uh, this is a correct picture. So you have uh, analyticity in the upper low, low, lower plane, you can have bound states, but on the physical sheet, that's the only thing you have. And the same holds for polynomial boundedness. But if you take t be, uh, above 4m square, so I take uh, you know, t to be 10m squared, then uh, it has been proven. So that's. Um, that's the status. And the way you prove it is that first you use a quantum field theory postulates like Whiteman axioms to say derive the uh, fixed uh, T dispersion relation and then you use unitarity to extend this region to slightly positive T say from zero to four. So that's a usual. Uh, and, and, you, and everywhere you use techniques of analytic completion. So it's a bit subtle, but that's a, that's a story for, for QFT. Okay. Um, okay, so let me let me now review some basic things again. Uh, so we have unitarity, and we want to say what does it imply for this t function. So it it relates discontinuity to the square of the amplitude, and uh, say for two to two scattering, uh, it becomes the statement that uh, so here you can look at the picture. If you take discontinuity in S, and by discontinuity I mean you go above and below, and you take a difference. You have a two-particle state that contribute, and say by zeta symmetry, you have a four-particle state contribute, and so the discontinuity is related to all these terms. I wrote explicitly here the only two-to-two two scattering, uh, but if you have uh, say two-to-four, two-to-six, etc., these are also all there. So this is this is optical theorem. Now um, this kernel, let me kernel, let me comment quickly on this kernel P because it will have some nice. Uh, well, it will have some, play some role. Um, this uh, kernel is uh, explicitly known, of course. It's a completely kinematical object. It has in it a theta function, which has a geometrical origin, which is that if you consider two ingoing particles in the center of mass and two outgoing, and you consider two intermediate states, and you draw the angle theta 1 and theta 2, and theta angle between the ingoing and outgoing particles, you see that if all the vectors are in the plane, theta 1 and theta 2 are equal to theta, if you remove this q vector from the plane, you will have theta 1 plus theta 2 larger than theta. But for any physical scattering, you always have this theta 1 plus theta 2 larger than theta. So this is a theta function. Um, and uh, it also has this nice representation, uh, this PD. You can write it as a series of product of three Legendres, which will, of course, become the statement that unitarity will become simple in, in the angular momentum eigenstate basis, and, uh, and this formula should understand as a distribution, so if you integrate it against some functions, the series converges. Uh, but this is a, this is a nice uh, uh, representation. 
So let me now go to the equation, which uh, I think if you uh, um, have only worked on CFTs, a lot of fun because you don't have it in CFTs. Uh, namely, in the gap theory, we have uh, this special set of energies, say here between four and 16, where you can produce only two particles. And therefore you get this uh, non-perturbative equations where the imaginary part is equal to amplitude square. And uh, in some sense, you can think of it as some generalization of the non-relativistic limit. I don't mean anything but just in the non-relativistic limit, which is a part of this region when S very close to four, you don't produce particles, but this, this region extends to say some finite range in relativistic theory. And as you will see, it leads to very interesting structures. And uh, this is exact non-perturbative equation. Now, um, I will use few tools uh, to, to make some progress. And uh, the one, the, the tool, which is, uh, I think, uh, sort of is a central in this story is a so-called Mandelstam equation, which I will explain in a, in a second. And, and then uh, to perform analytic computation, uh, one, or at least I need a small parameter. Uh, that's, uh, that's, I don't know how to, to, to make progress otherwise. And, uh, and the, the two small parameters, which are kinematically uh, always there, one is uh, something we call the threshold expansion. And uh, one is a statement that if we have a massive theory, we have a non-relativistic limit. Um, but it will not be just that. So uh, it's not be just a non-relativistic limit, but it will be some non-relativistic limit on relativistic steroids. So it, it will have some interesting twist, but that's a one kinematical parameter. And one is something familiar from the CFT bootstrap, it's large spin, but this is, it's very, it, it, this is something familiar. So I will briefly mention that. And uh, now something I'll try to explain, it's a bit of uh, um, uh, maybe, intricate scheme, but what I'll try to do is that, okay, we will start with low energy, low spin data, something you say measure an experiment, and we will ask how elastic unitarity crossing and elasticity constrain the amplitude based on this data. This would be the basic game we will play, and, uh, and then how uh, we can maybe implement it numerically in the end. But so in the end, I hope to explain everything, all the words which are on this picture should be, should be clear by the end of the talk, but that's uh, the basic idea. So I will not say anything about the possible low energy, low spin data values. For example, what the, the numerical group bootstrap uh, is do, has done the analysis of uh, the scattering length. This is, uh, is the input here, but I will more focus on elastic unitarity, et cetera. And of course we will see as, a, as an outcome based on this general arguments that we will see particle production. So this is something that comes out of crossing and uh, internal consistency. Um, so let me explain you the basic tools and what is this Mandelstam, um, what is this Mandelstam equation? So first of all, of course, if we have function which is analytic in some region, you can expand it in the partial waves. So this Z, I already wrote it somewhere, it's uh, simply related to S and T, it's an angle. And so it's, uh, this fact is known, sometimes called as a Neumann's theorem, but basically if you have a function, you can expand it in partial waves in some region of analyticity. Um, these FGs are known in the literature as partial waves and they, uh, they're also real analytic. And if you remember that if we start with this elastic unitarity before, and you remember that the kernel has this nice form of product of three Legendres, which, uh, which has to be the case because the scattering, the, the, the scattering process is invariant has a symmetry on the rotation. So if you project this equation to some uh, particular partial wave by integrating against Legendre, you just get something very simple and diagonal. So the imaginary part of F is equal to F square. So this is uh, the same equation written in, in, in this nice basis. Um, and uh, sometimes it's convenient to include also disconnected piece. So you add the it's just a definition. I define this S as one plus I F and then elastic unitarity, which was written here becomes that S is equal to one, namely that uh, the scattering phase is just completely real between four and 16. And this is for odd for even spins. And if you go to higher energies, the, there has to be some production. So this S of J is less than one. So this is the usual story. And you will think, okay, well, elastic unitarity seems to be such a um, boring fact, it's just a pure phase, but as you will see, as a, 
in a second that when we combine this with analyticity, things become more interesting. So how do we exploit um, uh, analyticity or how we, what we, we can do, how we can, what we can do with this thing? Well, another standard tool, and uh, again, familiar from the CFT bootstrap, recently in the discussion of Lorentz inversion formula is uh, what's known as the Professor Weber formula, where you can start with this, uh, this partial wave, which is given by a projection of the amplitude on a given harmonic. So it's this integral from minus one to one. You can write it as a, rewrite it as a discontinuity. And then you deform the contour. And uh, so this is related to Shri's question. You can deform the contour on the partially if you don't assume extended analyticity all the way to infinity. Or you can, ex and this is called sometimes in literature truncated for Sarviba formula. Or you can expand it all the way to infinity and uh, and then you get the usual for Sargiba formula. And of course, on the way you assume polynomial boundedness and uh, assume that you are dropping the, so assuming dropping that you can drop the arcs at infinity, you get the, the for Sargiba formula. And uh, the, what the main thing that happens here, or one of the things that happen is that we started with the amplitude and, uh, and uh, the representation for partial wave in terms of the amplitude, but now the, um, uh, the f is written in terms of discontinuity of the amplitude. So it's a dispersive data and usually nice things, many nice things, or some things happen which, which are more manifest in terms of this dispersive, this dispersive discontinuity data. And uh, again, uh, this, this formula satisfies all, all the criteria of Carlson theorem, so you can analytically continue it and spin, and at this point uh, you can think of FJFS uh, as a function of G, which is analytic for real J larger than some fixed value dictated by the behavior of the amplitude. So at this point, we, we, re we rewrote uh, the partial waves in terms of discontinuity. So this is the analog of the inversion formula. And uh, now it's analytic and spin. So of course, now the next step you can note, okay, well, we started with uh, elastic unitarity. So now let's analytically continue it and spin. Um, and um, and yes, of course, you can do that. So the right hand side, this is. Yeah. Can, yeah. can you remind me a bit about J0? What do we know about J0? J0 is. Yes, that's a, a great question in a non perturbative uh, theory. What do we know about it? We know that for S than less than 4m squared uh, or equal than 4m squared, J0 is less or equal than 2. So for, for, le for less than 4m squared, it's strictly less than 2. Uh, if we assume, and usually it's assume, I, I don't know, maybe someone has strength, there is some way to strengthen it, but you, usually we say that the scattering, the scattering length of spin two is finite, which implies that J zero at four n square is also less than two. When S is larger than four n square, I don't think we know much in the non-perturbative theory. That's, I think, something that would be great to uh, understand. Usually people, uh, people, uh, have some uh, yes you you can you can prove a little bit more for example in the elastic strip when uh, when uh, s between 4 and 16 there is a set of results which can roughly be called Gribov's theorem which tells you about possible regular behavior and you can prove that for example the the imaginary part of j0 has to be positive on the strip um, and so the usual assumption that it, which in which seems to be physically uh, meaningful because you, this the fact that the imaginary part of j zero is uh, is uh, positive is is related to the fact that uh, the the resonances say they they go into the second sheet so they they become unstable and this can be traced to this sign of this imaginary part and so the usual assumption that the imaginary part is uh, uh, positive but as far as I know it has been proven between four and sixteen but then it's there are some discussions but not rigorously and uh, usually it's, it's uh, assumed also that it doesn't grow faster than linearly the real part so i guess you maybe you've seen say mandelstam writes dispersion relation for j j0 of s and the assumption is that it's something like a plus bs where b is the tension of the string a is, a is the intercept and there is imaginary part related to uh, uh, the non the fact that things decay or uh, but it would be great to, to establish it rigorously. Some, that's something I think, uh, at least I would, would like to understand. Uh, is it positive? Better. Is it expected to have a positive real part? 
So in your box, you wrote real part of J bigger than J zero, but now you are saying J zero is complex. So there should be a real part. Yeah, of yeah. So here, uh, let me let me bound let me bound T by a power which is real, just by real power. So I can write it like that. So I'm not saying that T behaves like T to the J zero of S. I just bounded by by a real power. Yes, yeah, sorry. Maybe uh, here, real part of J in this formula has to be real larger than J J zero of S for the integral to converge. Now, if T behaves uh, like t to some power j0 of s, which can be complex, then uh, um, the real part, I don't think, uh, um, yeah, do we know that it's, uh, I don't think we know that it's positive. It can be negative, which will be the statement that the amplitude decays, but, um, but there are various bounds how negative it can be, and it cannot decay probably faster than uh, something I, I will have to remind. So th there are some bounds, at least in the physical region. Again, in the physical region, if you go to higher S, at least to me, I, we, I don't think we know much about uh, the, the real part either. So I guess the usual picture is that, um, let's say we have large MQCD, we have a linear rigid trajectory, and naively, if we have finite N, okay, now it's, again, the real part stays linear, but we get a little imaginary part. This picture will be correct for some S, if we go to S to be very large, I'm not sure what happens. Someone, ha if someone has an insight about this, it would be great to discuss. Um, so, yes. Now that we have uh, uh, this things analytic and spin, you can analytically continue and spin this equation. And uh, the right hand side, you see that F is written in terms of discontinuity. And in the left-hand side, here is a new player in my talk that comes in. You take an uh, imaginary part for this, this difference. And uh, it is given now in terms of something called rho. And rho is uh, double discontinuity or known in, uh, we call it double spectral density. So this is just a double discontinuity of the amplitude. And you see now in this way, what happened is that we rewrote the elastic unitarity in terms of purely dispersive data. So on the right-hand side, we have first discontinuity. and the left-hand side, we have a second discontinuity. Uh, so you can ask, OK, is there a way to forget again about this uh, partial waves and go back to the original equation, which I started with discontinuity of t is equal to t squared, and express elastic unitarity after some massaging in terms of discontinuities? And the answer is yes. And this was done by Mandelstam. And this is called the Mandelstam equation. So. Uh, this is a very cool equation. It states that in this uh, elastic region, the double spectral density, rho, is equal to integral of a uh, square of the discontinuity with some kernel. So I will discuss the properties of the kernel in a second, but if you wish, this is, a, we have a, what Lorentzian inversion formula is to partial wave expansion the same as Mandelstam equation to uh, the original elastic unitarity. So, um, and how do you see, how do you go back to the, this uh, elastic unitarity at complex spin? Well, you integrate both sides with Q and you use this identity, which is the integral of the discontinuity of this kernel against Q, gives you a product of two Qs and then, so, if you integrate the left-hand side with this Q, Q, Q gigabauer polynomial, you get imaginary part of, from a previous slide. And then the right-hand side, you use this identity and you get back um, this, this thing. And uh, this nice identity, it can look a little bit mysterious, but it follows from the fact that this Mandelstam kernel can be written as a sum of PQQ. Um, and, and then uh, this identity is nothing but for our Gibb formula for the Mandelstam kernel. So, uh, so if you wish, this is a more fundamental fact, and this it trivially follows. But anyhow, so this is a, a this equation is, if you wish, it solves this complex, this elastic unitarity for complex spin. And the, the nice thing about it compared to the previous slide is that now we have a crossing symmetric object. We started with elastic unitarity, which did not have crossing symmetry, and uh, now we have uh, we have found some we we rewrite it and, and we use analyticity and we got this raw and the raw is crossing symmetric and this would be the interesting i guess uh, the, the interesting thing so now we have this object and it's crossing symmetric what do we know about the double spectral density for the non-perturbative amplitudes 
Uh, but before, let me, let me, yeah. Yeah, before we proceed, can you explain better? So what is the region of validity of this equation? Yes, yeah, so S, S is between 4 and 16, T is anything. But wasn't, I mean, you, you said that you didn't know J0 for uh, S greater than 4 and square. Yes, yes. So this, this equation is valid for S between 4 and 16 in any T. Uh, you can derive it independently. I just wanted to connect it to this complex spin uh, because maybe some people are more familiar with this, but originally the way Mandelstam derived it, it, you don't have to go through this. But this follows from an analyticity, and if your S is between 4 and 16 and T is, say, arbitrary positive, then when this equation is non-trivial, uh, this holds. So it's important to keep one variable between. Let me maybe go here. This equation here, is valid for S between 4 and 16 and any T and the interesting T will be positive real T. Okay. So this, is, 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 if you wish, there is no here some uh, bound on J when, you know, when it's valid on the previous slide, we have some J for which the formula makes sense. But uh, this, uh, if you have this formula, then the identity will, will hold as soon as uh, this integral converge and this integral converge for the previous slide, but the original equation correct so yeah so this is a this is a um, this is a cool equation so let's study it a little bit so let me first uh, tell you about this Mandelstam kernel so you can write it very explicitly that's it's written here uh, it has again the same theta function well or related theta function uh, but it does not have uh, an immediate geometric geometric interpretation as before, because we are in a physical signature. And uh, we started with this kernel P where the sign was opposite. Uh, and the flipping of the sign that this theta functions tell you that in this positive S and T theta larger than theta one plus theta two is related that we go to complex angles. And if you wish, we're going from cosines to cautious. And so if you want cosine of theta to be larger than theta one plus theta two, you want theta to be less than theta one plus theta two. And if you want to be cosh of theta to be larger than cosine cosh of theta one plus theta two, you want theta to be larger. But anyhow, it has this theta function. And is literally is this statement uh, that uh, uh, for this complex angles now uh, says eta plus and eta pl minus is cosh of theta one plus theta two or theta one minus theta two. And uh, the, the, the integral that in this uh, Mandelstam equation is uh, in the finite region. So here's the region of integration. So here we have this equation. You have to integrate from Z1. Z1 is a, a two particle threshold. So you start from the two particle threshold and you integrate into some finite region, uh, which is dictated by theta function. And uh, Note that also that if you start with a row, say in the S channel, let's say we call it S channel, S between four and 16, then the discontinuity, the enters and the equation is in dual channel, so it's T of T. So um, that's a formula. Uh, is there, are there any questions about that? Yes, uh, Sasha. So you seem to be getting row of S and T in a region where you did not understand the analyticity of the original amplitude very well. Is that correct? So uh, let go, let's go back. So I, I, assume, I assume that this picture holds. So if you take S and T, that's what I call the extended analyticity. If we take S, say, you know, positive and T to be positive, we still have just unitarity cuts. So this is, Everything I, everything I said, starting from the derivation of Ross Arbibov, relies on extended analyticity. So this is surely assumed in deriving this equation. So already, you know, when I start talking about Ross Arbibov and this formula, as I deform this contour, I assume elastic, I assume extended analyticity. Yeah, this is assumed. This yeah, is okay. Not, I would say this, for Ross Arbibov, you are in a better shape because it works I think in also in a region where analyticity is proven. No, uh, no, yeah. no. It's because in this formula, it's S and T are both larger than four and squared. So I think maybe you can you can maybe you can massage it and continue to S less than four. But at least in this formula, 
S and T are both larger than four and squared. Because wow. that's why T has a cut. So I think it's, I it's identical. So. OK, OK, thanks. OK, so we have the crossing and we have this kernel. So let's see what it implies. And here's this picture, which I guess maybe one picture which I want to remember is that uh, uh, if you if you look at this equation, that is what it implies that if you look at the double spectral density, there is a finite region here where rho is zero. Then there are something um, no, we call say elastic strips. This is four and sixteen. This is a region where you can write Mandelstam equation as I as I presented it. And then there is a multi-particle uh, multi particle region, which is more complicated and we can discuss. These curves are known as Landau curves. The, the uh, shape is fixed by kinematics. And uh, we call this the region time and shadow because I, I guess I haven't been there, but I told you there was a discussion last year with Simon that uh, indeed if you, there are the so-called time and relations and amplitudes that the overlap and discontinuities are zero. It's usually discussed in the physical region of high point amplitudes, but this, uh, the origin of this uh, shadow here or the, the region where rho is zero is the same. We start with unitarity equation and we continue it. And so it would be interesting to understand if there are, if there are time and shadows for high point amplitudes. I don't know if it's known, but the idea is that we can always write this optical theorem for high point amplitudes and we start continuing them. We can start continuing them like Mandelstam did to do two. So this is a general feature of scattering amplitudes. So this is a picture. Well, this is a this is a scary region with multi-particles. This is something we control a little bit better. So we will be talking about that. Now, uh, what? Let me comment on what well, this picture might confuse you. So what 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 do I mean exactly by by these curves and what happens in this elastic strip? So, so let me start something familiar. Is that we are all familiar with normal thresholds. The amplitude has the state of functions when you multi produce multi-particles. So the claim is that the, for rho, it's the same. Rho has develops its support along the set of curves. These are known as Carpus-Landau curves. Uh, they are in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, diagrams. Uh, so uh, I guess you can ask how, uh, how rigorous is the statement. It's probably not fully rigorous, but it's it's probably correct, and uh, it's it's just a consequence. Should be a consequence of unitarity and analytic continuations of multi-particle phase space integrals. And anyhow, so that's what I think is true. And moreover, in the elastic region, you can classify all these curves. And by this, I mean that assuming the minimal set of curves for which you can solve elastic unitarity, and there are infinitely many curves, like there are infinitely many normal thresholds, there are infinitely many curves with the known equations. I will not go through how to derive it, but Essentially, you derive it from Mandelstam equations. So this is just to say that here I didn't draw all these curves in the elastic region, but they are there. So in principle, the structure here is quite complicated. And it's one of the challenges where you don't know how to, how to impose it, and, but we'll discuss it. So this is the structure of double spectral density. And so what do we know about it? Well, it's uh, for positive S and T, it's real. It is crossing symmetric. and uh, if we want to do bootstrap, we would like to have positivity. And luckily, rho st is positive in some region close to the leading Landau curve. And it is positive because if your scattering is non-zero. So if your scattering is non-zero, then you can just see that rho here has to be positive because it's a sum of a positive definite terms. It's a little bit like optical theorem. And this observation is due to uh, Mahu and uh, Martin. So. Again, if scattering is non-zero, by Mandelstam equation, you see that rho is positive. And uh, you can already expect that this should be the case, because if you remember in Mandelstam equation, rho is equal to the square of discontinuity. In this region, discontinuity is like a total cross-section, and it's positive. And, and therefore, you, and the kernel, the Mandelstam kernel, again, has nice property. It's positive, so everything is positive, and rho is positive. So now we can prove the Axe theorem in uh, one minute. Um, and uh, this is a, the maybe a more clear mathematical way of this intuition, which I started with, with the impact parameter scattering. Imagine that we have a theory uh, with some elastic scattering. So it's between four and 16, there is a region where rho is zero, is, is, is zero as, as follows from elastic unitarity. So now no particle production implies that you can use elastic unitarity for arbitrary energy. 
which means that this window between 4 and 16 continue. That's one picture. So that's what we got from no particle production. On the other hand, from the fact that there is scattering and crossing in the Mandelstam equation, you use that there is a region where rho is non-zero here. And this region is below the red curve. So you have, therefore, we have contradiction between three things, scattering and crossing, and the no particle production. So there is a contradiction. Therefore, that's it. And the way it works in, for physical theories is that if you go to this region and you try to implement the crossing of rho, the way it works is that you have, say, you don't have to go to arbitrary large energies. You can sit somewhere here, S between 16 and 36. And so and in one channel, you have a, a two to four scattering. This is a rho uh, written in one channel. So I wrote here this Mandelstam two to four. This kernel, again, it's a kinematical kernel, which should be, can, one in principle should be able to derive by analytically continue uh, relativistic phase space integrals. There were very few papers on that in the past. It's, I think it's an interesting problem to explicitly derive the left-hand side of this equation. But it's important that here you have two to four. And then on the right-hand side, you have uh, this continuity of two to two amplitude times a Mandelstam kernel. And the great thing about this is that everything that enters here in this, say, in some of the region is positive. The, this kernel is positive. This discontinuity is also positive. You can use partial waves for it. Uh, for example, if uh, if one takes guys your results for numerics, you can you can bound it by a few low spin partial waves. So if you truncate the sum, everything is positive. So you can no matter how much if you just know J zero and J two, you can use this equation and 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 and, and uh, bound the left hand side. Of course, the challenge is then that here you have this continuity of two to four in some unphysical region, and then how do I translate it to the statement of two to four for physical region? This is, of course, a uh, great problem. Uh, and maybe if we understand better this two to four, we can, we can use this equation. But I don't know how to do that. So this is the Axe theorem. Um, the questions about that? Yes, uh, Sasha. So um, Axe theorem, I think, basically um, says that you have to go to I thought the original result only tells you something that inelastic scattering must happen at very large spin. Um, and you can, you can uh, so you we will go. We, more we, general? we will go. We will go. Uh, we will go into that. So I think here at this point we just say that uh, um, you know if you go to S between S twenty, this this object is not zero. So, but this is a statement about two to four amplitude. Uh, so if I want to now translate it to the physical region, the price to pay is uh, go to large impact parameter space and large impact parameter space is the same as large spin. So if, if you wish, the, the, another way to say the Arts theorem tells you that the discontinuity of T two to four uh, along some, uh, in some unphysical regime is non zero. And if you want to translate the statement about the statement about the original problem of two to two, it's the same as going to large impact parameter, large spin. So it's equivalent. Okay, it's not clear maybe from this, but you will see that. Yeah, it's a, it's a basic thing that this discontinuity controls large spin physics. So if the fact that it's non-zero, we can restate it as a large spin thing. So now let me go to the uh, the bootstrap scheme and uh, tell you a few a few few things. I, I don't have too much time, so I'll be brief. Uh, one is a threshold expansion. So threshold expansion is uh, something which is known, I guess, in nuclear physics. So and it is used there. You can solve elastic unitarity for this uh, f's, and you can expand it in the non-relativistic limit. And so this a's and b's they uh, they describe uh, the on relativistic potential in the non-relativistic limit. Um, so there is this solution to elastic unitarity. And here um, there are parameters, which B, I, J, and A, J. A, J is a scattering length, which are known from the experiment or from somewhere. But this is the most general solution to elastic unitarity. One comment I want to make is that in D odd, you see this log. This is just general comment that in even D, the nature of the two-point particle cut is we have just square root, but in all dimensions, we have infinitely many uh, sheeted Riemann surface. So it's quite 
different, but okay. Now this is a non-relativistic limit. This is something familiar. Um, uh, uh, well, you can consider some examples, it doesn't matter, but then you can take this threshold expansion for partial waves. So we use, we solve the elastic unitarity and you can translate it to the threshold expansion on the discontinuity. The way you do it is you plug it into the um, partial wave expansion and then you see when S goes to four, the Legendre's blow up. But because of elastic unitarity, this imaginary part of F goes like this small parameter to the 2J. And therefore, if you take discontinuity, then the, the threshold expansion of uh, partial waves uh, turns into threshold expansion of the discontinuity. And higher spin partial waves are suppressed just because you have here 2J and here minus J. So the higher J terms in this sum are suppressed. And if you try to run the same argument for the amplitude itself, it wouldn't work. So it's important that uh, we threshold expand the discontinuity of the amplitude and not the amplitude itself. Now, something which is not probably familiar to the nuclear physicist because it's a relativistic effect is that if you take the Mandelstam equation, uh, you see that this region of integration, it as, you, as you go close to Landau curve, it shrinks to zero. And the shrinks to zero, you see in this integral, uh, the integral starts from uh, two particle thresholds and go a little bit. Therefore, close to the Landau curve, the integral is again localized uh, close to the two particle threshold. And again, therefore, you can expand double spectral density close to the Landau curve starting from the um, effective range expansion. So this is uh, something neat that comes out of the Mandelstam equation. Now, um, okay, what do you do with it? Well, you can plug it into frost algebra formula, and this is, I, I, don't, I don't want to spend much time, it's one, one slide maybe. It's the same as a CFT bootstrap. You just see that the threshold expansion, which is in this sense analogous to the light cone OP, translate to one over J expansion. And this just follows from uh, the, this inversion formulas. So. It's literally, that's, that's a mapping. And there is a useful inversion integral that we found useful to do some computations. It's uh, if you take this Q uh, J that enters the frost r Gribov and you integrate it against the threshold expansion, which in this language becomes Z minus one it gives you back a Q, Q function. It's a neat formula. And then in, in this sense, you can do, you can work exactly in one over J expansion. You don't have to really expand in one over J, but you invert just term by term the threshold expansion. Um, for example, the way, the, so, so I, I, how do you get a large J in elasticity from that? Uh, so let me consider this ratio and, um, and, uh, this ratio is, uh, is one if you don't have particle production and let me take a log of it. So it's, it's, so this log of it is zero if you have elastic unitarity and by, by using, uh, crossing, you can compute this. And, and what I told you already, you can compute these things at, at large J. How do we do that? Let's say we go to some S, I don't know, S equal 40. So it's somewhere here. So in the frost r of integral, you compute discontinuity or rho along this straight line, straight vertical line. Now in the elastic region, you know rho from the Mandelstam equation and you can compute it. Um, and uh, the partial wave themselves are controlled by, again, by the two particle threshold. So you can compute it and you get that there is this inelasticity. Uh, at large j and uh, the, this ratio at large j has a universal, universal form. It has linear and j times the ratio times this log plus something of order one and I plot this ratio of the log. It somehow happens to be maximal at s equal 40. Now uh, this is a formula at large j. You can ask, okay, how do I use it for finite j? This is, you can, you can, you can run this machine for a given model, given computations. So this is technicalities, but more interestingly, you, you, you would like to say, okay, how do I do that for finite S and finite J? And of course, this is a hard part and uh, something extra input is needed. So okay, one extra input is probably to do the multi-particle bootstrap, but okay, I don't know how to do that. There's some other way, but let me continue in a more pedestrian way, which is that I would like to put an error. Let me assume some shape of the discontinuity. So vaguely, we... Uh, so. Generally, we expect the discontinuity uh, to have this form. There is some threshold expansion, which controlled by these parameters. There are some maybe bumps and resonances, and there is a regular limit. 
So if someone lets you this information, I can approximate the discontinuity by some number, some few, for example, few parameters from the threshold expansion, which are measured in the experiment, some delta t. And the extra input is, of course, if, if I can bound delta t. So if you can bound delta t, and in practice, for example, we can run numerical bootstrap to bound this, this bound, or maybe some other way, then uh, you can put error bars on all the formulas. So uh, that's kind of obvious, but the, the non-trivial part is that it's not, it's not like that given this bound, you immediately get uh, the, the error bars on all the formulas. You have to go through this bootstrap scheme. You have to use elastic unitarity. You have to use crossing, and then you get non-trivial results. Just the bound on the, uh, on the re, re, this unless discontinuity will not give you this plot. So here's the Risto model, uh, which is motivated by numerical bootstrap. We start with this. It's uh, in, uh, and again in the paper with Bal, Pedro, and Joao, uh, and Miguel. So they considered this uh, universal sort of square root behavior. <coughs> They got it numerically some some behavior, which is a leading term in threshold expansion. And then if you do numerics, you see, say, for example, very simple error bounds, and then you can, you can produce plots where you, uh, you you use elastic unitarity to make predictions about uh, imaginary part of f of j and absolute value f of j at finite j and s. Then, uh, okay. Now, in the last uh, five minutes, I will discuss numerical implementation, and this is much more open-ended. So what I told you before, it's, uh, it just follows from the consistency. Now this is something we have to think more about. And uh, here I will quote the work of guys. So um, the, 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 the idea is that we can come up with a very convenient and, uh, and simple to implement uh, scheme where we take the amplitude and we expand it into this basis of functions. And we truncate then series, this also some ansatz, which you truncate, and then you implement uh, unitarity numerically uh, on a set of points on the boundary as for some finite g of max. And then you, you run your, your bootstrap task, like maximizing the coupling. And the, the amazing thing is that it's, you can restate it as semi definiteness, so you can use this, the, the usual solvers. And uh, the, the great thing about this ansatz is that it trivializes two things. It trivializes crossing, because you can just take this alphas to be symmetric, and this is crossing. And it trivializes ex maximal analyticity. So analyticity is manifest. Um, and then it keeps unitarity linear, which is also amazing. So it's very nice scheme. Now, there are a few things you might worry about. So first, as uh, I guess I will refer to this paper by, by these authors recently about distributional convergence. First, you might worry that if you think of this formula as an OPE, like an OPE in a CFT, this, we would like to impose, we would like to use this OPE on the boundary of convergence, which is uh, the region where you expect some uh, distributional features, thresholds, uh, normal thresholds, and so you might think, okay, this is hopeless because it will just not converge there. However, as reviewed by the in this paper for the uh, for the CFTs, it's actually better than that. This ansatz will converge distributionally on the on the boundary, so it's actually, uh, I mean, you have to check that it's there is a certain slow growth condition, so it's a certain theorem satisfied. But as far as I can tell, amplitudes has exactly this kind of polynomial conditions. So it's satisfied. So this ansatz converges distributionally on this cuts. And uh, however, you see that it's dangerous to impose uh, unitarity point by point. For example, here I consider an, an, an S matrix with inelasticity. Some toy model, you have a S equal one due to unitarity, and then it goes to less than one because you start producing particles. And then if you try to approximate this thing with some finite and max, you see that the danger is that we started with s equal one, and so if you have some ansatz, it will immediately start shooting off above the one. And so if you try to impose unitarity point by point, because the convergence is not so good, you you might be worried that you are losing these features which are non-analytic and it requires this distributional thing. And indeed, it's uh, if we integrate if we integrate the unitarity condition with some functions, I chose one function here. It is becomes much safer. It converges better and uh, 
I think it's uh, mathematically solid. So this puts this, this algorithm on solid ground and, and then nicely also that, again, it's discussed in these papers and it's directly applicable in this paper, directly applicable to the S matrix. For example, one of the problem is that you might work, this ansatz does not admit, uh, might need some modification for to implement high energy limit. Um, however, if you again think distributionally and if you consider a set of test functions which do not probe this high energy limit, as far as I can tell, it's, it will again converge and there is no problem. So it seems like a, a, a less, uh, so uh, for some problems it still might be okay to impose unitarity point by point, but generally we have to do it distributionally and uh, based on what we expect from the amplitude, we should choose a set of test functions on our answers for which we even hope to impose unitarity. For example, if we expect our amplitude to have this feature, it just doesn't, uh, it is not justified to impose unitarity point by point for n max of order 10, we have to, have to integrate. And this might, um, maybe you guys know uh, better, this might be related to the fact that in, in practice we never observe inelasticity, or maybe the, there is some other reason. This is just something I, want to, I wanted to mention because I think it's, it's important. Sasha, and sorry, can I ask yeah. you a question? So yeah. uh, the paper by Slava et al was about uh, the convergence on a CFT where the yeah. OP uh, mm. We know it's exponentially convergent, blah blah blah. Now in a QFT, we don't have such a strong result. Oh, so so how, sorry, can uh, we, how can we apply their results? Uh, yes, I mean, I, sorry. The convergence is a very op optimistic to me in a QFT. I, I didn't expect. So I first have to ask Leonardo how my, how many minutes do I have because I, I'm over time. Maybe I mean, you are just one minute over time. So I think how much do you need? Five, five from five to ten. Yeah, you can. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So here, I, I didn't use the OP in QFT. I just used an analogy. Analogy was the following, that if we have a, in this ansatz, uh, these row variables are less than one inside the disk, and we expect this, con this, this, this series to converge exponentially fast inside the disk. So if we keep far away from this uh, boundary of the disk, we expect it to converge pretty well for physical amplitudes. And it's, I think that we expect that any amplitude can be expanded like this close to the inside the disk. The, the tricky part, and this is related to, to what the, uh, in this paper, in this paper is related that we, we, what we try, where, when we try to impose unitarity, we try to impose it on the boundary of the disk. And here, as I, as I mentioned, because of the multi-particle thresholds, uh, you don't expect uh, this to be a function. It, is, it becomes a distribution. And then you might worry that, okay, all these rows become one, so does the series converge or not? And the claim of this paper is that, which they, they of course discuss CFTs, but situation is identical, as far as I can tell, uh, that it still converges distributionally. And, uh, and uh, as, as, uh, as, I, as, they, as they put it in the paper, we would like to emphasize that distribution converges is not just some abstract nonsense, but a very concrete prediction. And it's actually pretty, I find it quite amazing that we can, we still can use this ansatz if we start to if we start to average, but we have to be careful a little bit in imposing unitarity. Anyhow, this is a is it, is it equivalent to? I think I asked you already in the last discussion, but is it yeah. equivalent to just checking unitarity at zero point ninety eight instead of one? Would it I be don't know. How, I, making a small mistake, of course, but is it the same? I think I, I don't know the answer. I don't know. I don't know how would how to show that it is the same. So naively, it's different, but maybe in some in some way it's the same because indeed you, you can think of going inside the disk as averaging. And so, honestly, Pedro, I don't have a good answer for that. So uh, here, I guess maybe here, what I'm saying is that um, you don't have to even if you want. You, we can still do rigorous things on the boundary of the disk with this ansatz. That's uh, uh, maybe I missed the main the point yeah. because naively it looks that going inside the complexity is the same, right? We just change one by 0 0.98. Yeah. Starting to smear things and so on, I don't know. It uh, it makes us nervous, of course, right? I mean, yes, yes, but here, go, it's, uh, it go, looks like I think that, 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 well, the price to pay is that when you go inside the disk, um, we don't quite know what we're imposing, right? We haven't argued that it's, it's, it's less than one there. So you can assume that and hope that it's fine. 
here we don't have extra assumptions. This is just a rigorous procedure, right? So, so here you don't have to worry that what you're imposing actually makes sense because this is just the usual unitarity. So that's, I think, the advantage. So it's, 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 a, it's a rigorous procedure of working with this ansatz on the it boundary of the disk. What Pedro is saying would be true if this imaginary part by itself was an analytic function satisfying mm -hmm. some maximum modulus principle. But is this the case? As far as I know, we, don't have, function. we don't have this thing because uh, for this, I, I guess it was discussed, but this partial waves, they have a left cut okay. on which we don't have a boundary. So if one can understand the left cut, yes, one can do that. Okay, so now what about the elastic unitarity? Well, the one basic feature is that for finite and max, it's obvious that the numerical ansatz has immediately non-zero here. So it's just clearly it will never satisfy elastic unitarity. And so uh, you know, the fact that in this paper, elastic unitarity was not imposed, it, it just, it makes sense because you, you, you don't have to, you cannot impose it because the answer that's, there is no chance that it will be satisfied at finite and max. You can hope that it will emerge miraculously at infinite and max, um, but otherwise rho is non-zero. So an obvious thing is that you might try is to in, in, in change the ansatz such that it has the structure of rho equals zero. As I mentioned to you in principle, you have this infinitely many Landau curves in this region. So uh, you, but we can at least start by imposing that rho is zero in this, in this region. And the way to do it is, uh, well, you know, you want a function with a symbol as a, from the scattering amplitudes. You want this first discontinuity to start at a, uh, at the normal threshold and the second discontinuity at Landau curve. And okay, well, for example, this symbol, which states that there is a function has a first discontinuity at this position, normal threshold, and Landau curve has correspond to this function. So if you take this Li2 and you take, you check, it has the correct structures. And there are, actually there are infinitely, you, you can easily construct functions of this type by using Mandelstam representation, uh, depending on what kind of behavior you want at the normal threshold and so, uh, you can. Uh, this is a way to implement a shadow. So there are there are ways depends on, and depending on how much structure we want to implement, we can start taking these functions and multiply this by this by this rows, which uh, correspond to multi-particle thresholds. And so in this way, uh, by using this function with the correct analytic structure, we will have correct analytic structure. Now, of course, it's not the same as amplitude. Amplitude has infinitely many Landau curves, but it's doing a little bit better. Um, finally, one can uh, use uh, unitarity at non-integer spin. It's okay, as I told you, unit, elastic unitarity holds a real spin. So, but uh, we don't know how to impose it numerically. It's non-linear condition. However, we can impose SJ uh, less or equals than one for a real spin and uh, and uh, physical amplitudes which saturate this bound are within this class. So, this are extra constraint. And the same goes to the lower bound of an elasticity. For example, if we run the numerical bootstrap, but we decide even to start to work with a set of functions uh, with a certain class of the discontinuities, say they're polynomially bounded, they do not have uh, these outliers, uh, we can also implement it into numerical scheme by, uh, and, and use, uh, in, use, impose elastic unitarity by running this you know, bootstrap scheme. Uh, it predicts you uh, that, so in, in the original paper, you set this raw to zero, but you can, you can impose bound on an elasticity by, by computing this function. So let me conclude. Uh, I think, of course, the, the open question is, can we bootstrap physicalist matrices? And uh, I don't know, uh, let's, maybe we can do a little bit better with some of these uh, uh, techniques and recent developments. Um, I think interesting thing would be to, to observe uh, some amplitudes with regi growth and particle production. So far, we didn't see this thing in the numerics. And it's, you know, can we observe the saturation of frost are bound? And uh, um, some of these things might, uh, th that, we, that we discussed might allow for this. Um, then uh, there is a question of implementing elastic unitarity. Well, some of the features of elastic unitarity I, I discussed, we can implement the shadow, we can implement uh, this uh, bound and in, in elasticity. This, uh, but again, these are some parts of the problem. So in principle, elastic unitarity dictates more structure and then we can um, 
we can try to do better. Actually, in the, in the history of the subject, I know only one example where elastic unitarity was really implemented uh, fully. And this is a beautiful set of beautiful papers by Atkinson and collaborators where they use the fact that the Mandelstam equation has some uh, nice structure of contracting maps. And so if you start with some ansatz, sometimes it has a fixed point. And so um, you can use it by starting with something in multi-particle region and then uh, use this Mandelstam equation to find the completions that satisfy elastic unitarity, but this is highly nonlinear. It's not clear how to make it systematic and rigorous. So, but it's a, it seems to be interesting thing. Um, of course, the key question I think in this whole uh, subject is that can we say uh, what, how can we probe this multi-particle vision or, or can we proceed without talking about it? Uh, for example, how much progress can be made without ever addressing this multi-point amplitudes? Maybe we are incredibly lucky and we can pinpoint some uh, theories without ever starting this two to four. If we are unlucky, then it seems like it's incredibly hard. Uh, also, as I mentioned, that this Mandelstam equation was derived for two to two, but you can, in principle, if you're willing to study this high point phase space integrals, and there were some few papers in the past, you can try to derive high point versions of the Mandelstam equation by including more and more. Then it was related to what uh, Pedro was asking if, uh, if we can say something really solid and intelligent about this regi behavior and then physical regime, and we can use experiments and uh, maybe lattice to bound this at a local, to, to give a local bound on regi and uh, use it in the, in the scheme. Um, of course, it would be great to have a solvable example. And here, one question is uh, sort of, I guess, in a, we don't have a very good understanding maybe of kings and CFT bootstrap, but similarly, what makes a theory special? What kind of question we should ask uh, to find, uh, to, to pinpoint a theory? I think it's not clear. Um, the, of course, there could be completely orthogonal tools to what I was talking about, something from quantum information theory. There was a paper uh, one day ago. Um, and uh, finally, I think, uh, so this, this days we have a lot of uh, discussion of the swampland versus landscape. And uh, as far as it seems like the, the only solid way to proceed with this discussion is to do as matrix bootstrap for gravitational theories for charged particles. And uh, at least in high dimensions where there are no infrared divergences, this is something we should do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sasha. Beautiful talk. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I had a question. What about on the previous sli slide? No, no, on, the, on two slides back, you mentioned that this uh, that one should or may use uh, com com uh, continuous spins. Yeah. So I. Um, yeah, so I was wondering. Uh, why is this implementing elastic unitarity? I, I forgot. Sorry, you might. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. so um, uh, let me let me recap again. So we, we started with uh, unitarity being a statement about SJs to be less than one for even Js, right? Zero, yeah. two, four, six. Now, for S between four and sixteen, it saturates one. Moreover, we know that it has to saturate one for any spin. Therefore, between 4 and 16, when S is between 4 and 16, we can impose the bound that S of J less or equals than 1 for any spin. Because we know that the physical theories saturate this bound. And so if we find the set of theories with S of J less or equals than 1 for S between 4 and 16, they will include the physical amplitudes. So it is not elastic unitarity. It's, uh, it's elastic unitarity type constraint. It's something that can be still be linear, so we can use it in the numerics, and still, and but it originates, and we are allowed to impose it because we know that uh, physical theories are part of that. So here's this less or equal than one, and it's connection. It comes from uh, the fact that we want to make it linear. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, but can can I ask you a question about that? Because I mean, in our ansatz we had a finite number of parameters and then uh, we impose uh, only inequalities. Yeah. 
and we could find some non-trivial solutions. So I, I'm afraid that if you impose this now for any J, real J, including negative J, I guess you can even go, you will just like kill the answer. Yes, 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 yes. No, of course. I think, for example, if you start to include imposing these things and uh, uh, you know, if you start with this with your ansatz and you try to implement elastic unitarity, I don't think it, it makes so much sense because your ansatz does not have a feature of elastic unitarity. So maybe if, there is. If you, if you put these improved downsets that you're yeah, saying, then there is a at, chance to. Then at least I don't see the reason why it will be killing the ansatz, right? So here you know for sure that if you impose more and more, you will kill it. Right. But if you improve the ansatz, I don't have the argument that for sure you will kill the ansatz. Because in, this is a weaker bound. It's not quite elastic unitarity. Mm -hmm. So you might, be, you might be fine. I also have another question, sir. One of the more simpler things to implement that you suggested was this, take this uh, special function, multiply it by the old ansatz, yeah. and just yeah. repeat it. It's not, it's not an old ansatz here. There is important things that this rows, yeah. that is index n, which labels, um, so if, if you go, uh, so you see row, this row say it has a cut starting from four. This I would call row s1. Uh -huh. So here, row S2, it starts from 16. So uh, there is this label where the row has a cut between, say, 4 and infinity, 16 and infinity, 36 and infinity. So it's, it's the same, it's a function of the same analytic structure, but the cut starts at n particle region. Okay. So therefore, in this ansatz, if, if, you, if you multiply by old ansatz, you'll be back to this picture because the old rows have non-zero row here. If you want to implement the shadow, you have to multiply by uh, by rows for four particle things, which do not have any discontinuity in between four and sixteen, so they do not affect this picture. But once you okay, thanks. Yeah, I missed this this important Sorry. point. But once you impose this ansatz, <clears throat> then you said, well, but there might be still something more to elastic unitarity. But uh, this I. And yeah, so, because, so, yes. Because everything that, else just falls from analyticity, so it looks like if you have an ansatz which takes into account the fact that there, is no, there are no states between 2 so, and 4, and, uh, and there's analytic, then it looks like everything else should follow. Similarly, like uh, Euclidean bootstrap ends up producing results consistent with light cone bootstrap, because somehow it knows about analytics. Yes. So, um, yes, uh, hopefully, uh, what, what I meant by my comment is that here on this picture, I, I you know, I, you could have even said before that let's proceed with a naive ansatz and just hope that this, as we've sent n max to infinity, all the structure miraculously emerges, right? No, you can say that's good. No, the, how will this emerge? Yes, so this doesn't uh, seem to happen. So here, what we are saying is that let's implement this zero here and and then hope that the extra structure of Landau curves will emerge. So as I told you that, that this is a leading Landau curve, so we import row equals zero, but in principle, elastic unitarity tell you that there will be leading Landau curves, there will be next Landau curve. It might be that the ansatz just still uh, accommodates for it. it what, what I mean is that we haven't built it in, so it should come out from from implementing the elastic unitarity in numerical. It doesn't seem to. For example, if we, if we used all downsides and somehow we tried to impose the constraint that unitarity is exactly saturated between uh, two and four for all spins, could this then somehow asymptotically for large and max lead to no, you will get a zero. You will get only the free theory. No, mm -hmm. it is converging towards saturating eternity, but it never saturates perfectly. You really see as you increase n max, it's 90%, 93, 94. Really saturating completely, only asymptotically. Asymptotically, asymptotically, I understand. Yeah, I understand. 
Yeah, he can do 20, right? Maybe Andrea can do 30, I don't know, something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not that you can really see a synthetic difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, anyway. Of course, it's, it's nicer to implement it exactly if it's not too expensive. Sure. It's, uh, it's, uh, I think that the, the, it's just if you don't implement it, there is no reason for it to emerge. So you might be lucky for some reason that there is a connection between elastic unitarity and couplet maximization. For example, in, in, the, in the guy's papers, they observed that for j equals zero and j equals two, you have this, this things got start saturating elastic unitarity. Um, however, as, as, as far as I know, for larger j's, you, you don't see, it's not clear what's happening. It's not clear what's, what's, uh, what's, what's happening to this. Um, solution as we increase in max. But I'm just trying to say something very, very stupid and very trivial, but tell me that uh, it doesn't contradict to what you're saying. I'm just saying, suppose that we try to do what, uh, what uh, Joao and Miguel and uh, Walter and Pedro are doing and multi maximize the coupling, but simultaneously try to somehow impose the constraint which would asymptotically say that the S matrix in, in the region between two and four has to be close to saturating unitarity, just at the level of the, of, of the imaginary that, that the S matrix has to be some phase in this range. It Through might some be- some empirical procedure, but it's going to be approximate elastic unitarity imposed yes. just by hand at the level of, of their algorithm. And hope I, but that would emerge, right? In some maybe non-efficient numerical way, but it would emerge. Yes, I don't. I, I I don't see a problem if we if we try to we we start with finite and max, and we try to imp, imp, as you said impose elastic unitarity type, yeah. something type constraint, and uh, and then as we increase in max, we we are approaching uh, this uh, this saturation. I I don't see. The problem with that, I think it's related here. What concretely what it means? Say, if you have finite and max, you do not impose elastic unitarity point by point, for example, because your ansatz here will oscillate. So you average enough, so you use test functions crude enough for the given ansatz to allow things. And then, as your ansatz becomes stronger, the crudeness becomes less. But I think it's a it's an interesting question how to do it efficiently. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, I agree. The best yeah. Way. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Can, can I ask you about this in practice? Because it seems to me that if you if you put test functions which are I mean with some given spacing, okay, testing some scale, and then you increase n max too much, you will just violate unitarity in between the gaps, right? It's like you Yes. I mean, you have to somehow balance you yes, 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 exactly. But this looks very arbitrary. How are you going to make this? Well, it's look, I think it, it looks uh, less arbitrary than doing it point by point, right? Because uh, the idea is that we have, uh, we have raw on the circle. Uh, it's just a Fourier transform. We have a set of normal thresholds. Uh, cutoff in N max is just cutoff in frequency. So it sets you a maximal harmonics. Therefore, you say that given n max, you just do not resolve harmonics lower than that. That's it. So that's a basic intuition, right? And similarly, we have accumulation point of uh, on the raw on the raw circle, we have accumulation point of non analyticity close to rho equal minus one. So therefore, you chop it off again there, and you don't allow your test function to to go there. And this should also allow for rigid growth. Um, Again, as this is for example, a, even if you just do that, if you don't impose unitarity all the way to high energy, mm. then uh, basically you lose the bounds. I mean, in one D, we know we lose the bounds. If, if there is a little bit of the disk where you don't bound the function, it will just escape. I mean, you then you can have any value inside the disk. Mm. It's, it's a subtle issue how to make it in practice. Well. It, you also have a new constraint from elastic unitarity. I don't know if this, you know, what is the interplay? It seems like there are several degrees of freedom you can use, right? I, I agree, it's, uh, it's not, uh, 
I cannot show you the, the plot where it works, of course. Uh, that would be the best thing that we don't have this discussion. <laughs> um, I was actually very happy even with this fact that these things will converge, uh, converge distribution or that there is this, there is this. I think it's very, because it's, it makes it very solid, at least to my taste, so that we really know what we are doing. Uh, can I ask if uh, if I wanted to study massless uh, particles instead, yeah. uh, is it correct to say that then I can keep the ansatz because I don't have a region where rho should be zero, and I, yes. I only have to average, I only have the problem of distribution or convergence? Yes, I think so. I think that's one great uh, great thing about massless particles, which I didn't appreciate before. But all the structure of Landau curves collapses to, to the corner. So this is a correct structure for massless particles. So theory is because we can, as far as I can tell, we can emit photons and, and so uh, somehow from this point of view, massless particles are much simpler. So if we consider scattering of uh, charged particles in a gravitational theory, something might be relative relevant to weak gravity. I think the sun's that should be fine. One should only, I would at least personally, I would worry about the distribution of conversions, but this is gone. So because elastic unitarity is gone. So it seems to be, uh, be much simpler. Actually, relatedly, is I think is it's not completely clear what, what is the analog of this in, in, in ADS and in CFT bootstrap, and there is some analog. We discussed with Joao and Simone a bit that Polyakov conditions or some seems to be related, but I, I don't think and it's not, I don't think it's very clear what if we take a what is the analogous story of uh, probably there is just none, but but maybe in some limit at least there should be. So maybe there is some interpolation. So for generalized free boson, yeah. you only have double traces flowing, right? If you Yes, yes, yes. So correlation functions where the spectrum would be a smooth deformation of generalized free boson, probably you would say they, they are the analog of just having two particles, no? The state yes. just uh, a little bit, but the, Yeah, are... yeah, yeah, exactly, yes. So, so, here the, the, so if you go to CFTs, analogy of course, of course, is very direct for all the quantities which I described. You know, G is T, double D is D, rho is quadruple D. But then uh, we have, as as Pedro just said, let's say we have ADS QFT, we have two particle states, we have a discrete set of operators, which are just two particle states, but. Uh, I'm not sure what is uh, the analog of elastic unitarity. It's a nonlinear equation. Somehow the amazing thing about it, it's a nonlinear exact equation, uh, which relates, uh, it's really something like relates double disk in terms of a uh, correlator square. And uh, perturbatively, if we cut the Witten diagram, we will have it, I think, in, in some form. It's just a. Uh, well, but. Isn't there an issue that, in fact, Space, you can literally have a symptotic two particle state, while in yeah. EDS, you necessarily would have some mixture of kind of multi particle states because you know, if you have two particles yeah, in EDS, yeah, they're yeah. going to collide, and if there is particle production, they're going to mix with states with more particles. So, this eigenstates of Hamiltonian are just some mixtures of these things. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a problem that we have in the box. And so, if we take the box to be large, this thing should emerge, but, um, but there is no such thing in the box. So um, we're a little bit out of time, but uh, any other questions? Well, I, I could ask about this uh, FRASA bound. So I think it would be nice to have an explicit amplitude that is crossing symmetric and uh, satisfies unitarity, at least as inequality, not necessarily elastic unitarity, that's probably too difficult, and saturates the FRASA bound. And at some point, we found some papers that were claiming something like that, but we, with Balt, we, in, the, in the end, we couldn't really nail it and understand what were these amplitudes. It was quite complicated. I don't know if you, if you read about these or if um, you such examples. Because for, from our ansatz, it's extremely difficult to imagine how to, I mean, you cannot do it with finite n marks. And, yeah, so again, this is something which I was, uh, I thought you might be, you might try to, maybe it's uh, too optimistic, but uh, you know, 
your the ansatz with finite and max it's fine it's it's consistent for example it will grow asymptotically but it will it will be consistent with them only for certain test functions so let's say let's say let's say we take uh, some things that grows and we expand to infinite and max your ansatz will capture it right now if you truncate of course it's a bad approximation however it's a bad approximation for certain functions so you know if you could, even if you could cook up a toy model which has this growth and we can understand how badly and what is the correct set of test functions and then we try to say maximize the total cross section by imposing this shadow we sh we might see that uh, we might see that it, it saturates but one should be very careful i think one should be very careful in imposing an iterative to allow uh, so somehow to allow the finite n max ansatz to capture the class of functions which we're interested in because if you just naively will impose an iterative point by point of course you will forget about that so, for sure but it seems like there is a room for interplay uh, for what we expect and what we impose and uh, maybe there well, is I was asking really if we if you know if we can write an example of a fun oh, that sorry. will oh. have this growth just so that we have an intuition of how you can satisfy crossing and unitarity that's a good yeah it's a good question and still have this big growth it's it's difficult i think at least we we so we let me suggest that we continue discussion privately if you're interested i could leave the zoom room open or if not you guys can communicate otherwise but no sh sure uh, Leonardo, please leave the zoom room open maybe we'll go on <laughs> for another five minutes or so so um sasha you are a co-host so okay so uh, I you can make me host so that Sasha doesn't feel because uh, last time we tried to make host to speaker, uh, the talk finished immediately. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Host. Um, so you're a host. Uh, well, thank, thanks, Sasha, again. And Thanks. Bye. Bye.